so thankful to have those by the internet visiting with us today. And if you'll open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, I'll do our reading and then we'll do a moment of prayer. We have been in a, a personal Bible study on 1 Corinthians 15 on the doctrine of the resurrection. <clears throat> Probably other than a message of salvation, which Paul goes into great detail, if you teach anything under the new covenant about salvation, you're going to teach out of, out of Paul's teaching as far as the theology. Uh, Paul does a, a tremendous thing here on the resurrection. One of the things that's really interesting about me, about Paul and his writing, is that he was a pastor that had to go through a change of dispensations and covenants. When he started out in his uh, life and his uh, faith, uh, it was under the old covenant and in the Jewish age. And he lived through that transition from the old covenant to the new covenant, from the dispensation of the, of the Jewish age to the dispensation of the church. And all that theology changed. Most of it, he spent his time trying to trace down. Jesus said, when I've come, I've come to fulfill the law. So he spent a great deal of his writing on proving that. And that's an interesting thing about studying the life of Paul and his teachings. Uh, he, he has, today is a classic example. I'm at the end now of our discussion. I broke chapter, six, uh, chapter 15 into six sections of study. I'm in my sixth sex, section. I'm in verses 50 through 58, but today I'm looking at 55, 56, and 57. He is now closing his argument. You know, Paul is a master of Greek debate. I mean, he was a master of it. Uh, apparently, growing up in a great culture of debate of uh, the language, um, Paul was really good at it. Uh, he was really good at it. <clears throat> For example, he argues that the resurrection, if there is no res resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no resurrection at all. Think about that. I mean, he says it all hinges on him. And he makes a strong argument in the Greek language in verses 12 through 19. He uses seven first-class conditions in a debate argument. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then if that's true, then this is true. And boy, did he paint a dark picture. Did he ever paint a dark picture? Now he comes down and he shows you some of the things that he has learned just by going through a change of, of ministry, of going through a change from Old Covenant thinking to New Covenant thinking, from Jewish age law to a church age grace. And he, I want to show you... He gives us a look inside the th his theology, ch theology change. And very seldom do we get such a clear look at it as we do here today. So I want you to read with me, not read with me, but um, follow along with me as I read 55, 56. Now, he's closing down his argument He's made an enormous argument on why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential to the whole theology of the resurrection. And, and the Old Testament and the New Testament all hinges around Jesus died on the cross, being buried three days and raised from the dead. It's essential for your salvation. It's essential for everything. And he lays everything on the resurrection of Christ. All of the theology of the resurrection which was Old Testament. All of the theology hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now watch what he does, because he, he reaches into one, apparently one of, his, one, of his, one of his authors, one of the Old Testament prophets that, that he took joy in, that Paul found common ground. He is, the, he is Hosea. 
And I'm going to show you why Paul found common ground with a guy like Hosea. Hosea is interesting, prophet of the Old Covenant. Hosea and Amos were prophets to the North Kingdom, while Isaiah and Micah were the key prophets to the South Kingdom. You know, we had a divided Israel. We had the North Kingdom and the South Kingdom. Both of them made up the priest nation of Israel. And so he, he talks about Hosea. Now, why I think Hosea is interesting to Paul is because it, it, Hosea writes of, the, of God's unconditional love and his justice. And he shows you how, how God has both. And the story of Hosea, the first three chapters of Hosea is about God's unconditional love. The, the name Hosea is salvation. And then from chapter 4 through the end of the book, the 14, he talks about God's justice. God's justice. And he says they're compatible. These are not opposites. And I think Paul, and when you get to, get to the fourth chapter in Hosea and go through 14, you're talking about the coming of divine judgment upon Israel because he was a prophet of doom as well as love. And he, he talks about the fifth cycle coming and he says it's going to come by Assyria. Now that's really important to Paul's lesson today. He reaches into Hosea and he pulls out the 13th, out of the 13th chapter, he pulls, chap, he pulls one verse out, verse 14 in his argument of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here it is. He says in verse 55, as he quotes Isaiah 13, 14, if you have a study Bible, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Two, two questions, right? Two questions. Two questions. He answers them in 56 and 57. He answers them. Two questions, and he gives you the answer. He's going to talk about the sting, and he's going to talk about the victory. Now, here's what he says. In verse 56, he talks about the answer to the sting of death. The sting of death is sin. The definite article with it. So he's talking about Adamic sin. In this passage, he's talking about a death. I mean, the sting of death, where does death come from? Well, death comes from Adam. Don't eat of the tree, and the day you eat, die, and you will die. That's where death entered in the whole business. Romans 5th chapter, verse 12. Uh, by one man, centered into the world, and death by sin, and so death spread uh, to all mankind. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. See, that, that, that was, Paul was so glad that he was out of that mess and into grace. In verse 57, he gives you the answer, O death, where is your victory? He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he asked two questions in 55 out of Hosea 13, 14, and he gave the answers to them, right? The sting of death and the victory. The sting of death comes from the first Adam, and the victory over death comes from the last Adam. Come on now. That's 1 Corinthians 15. He's already covered this. I just quoted 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He's already covered that. He has already covered 1 Corinthians 15, 22, when he says, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. See, he's already covered this. So I'm not, I haven't introduced anything that he hasn't already established theology-wise on. I'm just, I'm just, he's now summarizing. But, he, but listen to me, what's interesting is he reached in there and took Hosea 13, 14 as his proof text. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come back, and we're going to dig into this thing. We're going to take a look at this whole thing under the next four points. 
I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. This applies to these in our congregation as well as those who are visiting us by the Internet. You cannot study the Bible in carnality. You get zip. You get human knowledge, but you don't get spiritual knowledge, and you study the Bible for spiritual knowledge. Therefore, you can't study the Bible for spiritual knowledge if you're carnal. How do I identify carnality? Well, you identify carnality by identifying personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins or sins of the tongue. It could be any of those. And if you're aware of any, you're to examine yourself and make confession according to 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. This cleansing takes you back to verse 7 where it is talking about salvation this extension is now given to the Christian life by confession of sin. You get cleansed for sanctification, not for salvation. Salvation and cleansing is in verse 7. Sanctification cleansing is in verse 9. It brings you back to restored fellowship with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and that's important. So I'm going to give you a moment. I'm going to give you a moment to do self-examination, confess your sins. Let the Holy Spirit teach you the truth from the Word of God, especially on this subject, the sting of death. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God, uh, however far this needs to reach, whether it's from the sound of my voice and in, in measured by feet or beyond... Uh, the mileage calculation. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity to stand and represent the truth of the Word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister that truth on the sting of death and show us the power of the resurrection in our life. Show us the power of the resurrection in our life for the, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, Paul said in Romans 8, chapter, verse 11, lives now within my own body the person of the Holy Spirit, and my body has become the temple of God. I'm a mobile church for Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that, Father. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our lesson today is going to look at this passage where Paul presents two questions out of Hosea 13, 14. And then answers them in 56. He answers about the sting of death and he answers about the victory. O oh, death, <coughs> where's your uh, sting? O oh, oh, death, where's your victory? So I'm, I want us to look at that. We are at the very end of our discussion out of 1 Corinthians 15. We'll do a few more studies from it before we leave it. But we are pretty close to the end. I took you all the way to verse 58. I held it because of the word therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore, you ask why for, and <laughs> that's the whole chapter. <laughs> so when we get there, I'll do a review, see, because he forces me because he used the word therefore. It forces you to look all the way back and do a summary. So I will do that when it comes time to do that. But Paul, what, what is interesting to me is how he took <coughs> Hosea, <coughs> moved it from an old covenant to a new covenant, how he moved it from the Jewish age to the church age, theologically. That's what stirs my interest, <coughs> how he did that. And he did it wonderfully, and I don't want us to miss it today, so hopefully I'm going to be able to bring it to your attention. Under next four points, first of all, Hosea, <clears throat> Paul, Paul closes his theological argument about the resurrection based off from Christ to the rest. He bases it, uh, his final argument comes from Hosea. I'm, I'm amazed at that myself. Hosea 13, 14, which he talks about in, 50, in 55, 56, 57. Now just to remind you a moment, Hosea was the 8th century B.C. national prophet to the north kingdom of the priest nation. He and Amos, Amos and Andy, but it was Amos and Hosea. 
That, that was the team that was out there on the front line to the North Kingdom. And they were both storming. They were prophets of those storming that the fifth was coming to Israel, that they had violated every act of abomination that was possible, and the fifth would ride over them. And Hosea says it will be Assyria, and it will be soon. That's interesting. Over in the south kingdom, you got, you've got uh, Isaiah and you've got Micah. They're preaching like crazy to tell the south kingdom, keep your eye on the north kingdom because you're going the same way. This will be a wake-up call. That will be a sign for a wake-up call of uh, a real reformation of theology in our, in our south kingdom. <clears throat> And it worked for a while. <laughs> it worked for a while. This, the, the North Kingdom is going to go out in 722, and the South Kingdom is not going to go out until 586. So it worked for a while. It worked for a while. And I suppose for most of us, uh, we've kind of become content as preachers for it to work for a while. Well, God wants to work forever. God didn't send his son to the cross for a while. He sent it for ever. And, uh, but anyhow, I don't want to get too far away from my lesson. Hosea, Hosea warns them of the coming of the fifth cycle and even identifies Assyria as he gets to the close of his book. Now, where does he get the right to talk about a fifth cycle of divine discipline upon the priest nation of Israel? Well, it's very clear in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Very clear teaching. Now, the, the, the great book that's in the tabernacle, in the Ark of the Covenant, is the book of Deuteronomy. And that was their book. And boy, it was, it's clear in Deuteronomy 28. And so all the prophets of the nation, they're, they're making all these references out of the book that's in the inner sanctuary. The book of the law that, taught, that covers it all in detail. Well, what he says in Hosea 6 sets this up. Now, I want to show you. In Hosea, the 6th chapter, verse 7, he says, he's referring to the north kingdom. He says, but like Adam, they, the north kingdom, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. Now he's talking about, when he's talking to, about Israel, he's talking about the old covenant. When he's talking about Adam, he's talking about Genesis 2, 16, 17. But that's where the old covenant really started. Oh, yeah. First Corinthians, First Corinthians 15, 45. The first Adam... And the last Adam. The first Adam is, the, introduces the old covenant. The last Adam introduces the new covenant. Come on now. You know, this is, this is 101 stuff here. But you see, for the Israel as a priest nation, they understand the covenant being the old covenant. But you see, Paul, Paul, uh, uh, Hosea did something that Paul liked. He connected the old covenant's origin to Adam who violated the first covenant who, which had a positive in verse 16, eat of any of the trees and a negative, don't eat of this one tree in the middle of the garden, die and you will die. They, Paul loves that because, he, I mean, when you hit the book of Romans, you hit the, when you, listen, he's already dealt with it in Romans 5 earlier, but he's, he's already dealt with it. Listen to me now. He's already dealt with it in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 45. He's already made this theological connection. <clears throat> so that's, imp that's important for us to understand that when he, gets to when he gets to Hosea 13, 14. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. You know who the me is? Christ. Hey, listen, when you throw Christ out, you throw God under the bus. When you throw Christ out, you have just thrown God out. 
Do you understand that? They're inseparably linked. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. You can't reject Christ and not reject. See, Israel was so stupid. The church must not be that stupid. So, listen to, listen to what he says on Hosea 8.1. I'm just showing you how all this stuff links up in the book. I, I'm not going to do a study of the whole book for you. I'm just showing you some highlights. Listen, listen to what he says in the 8th chapter, verse 1, and, and, and then he's going to talk more about it in the chapter, verse 3. But here's what he says. Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant, they have rebelled against me. See that? In the 13th chapter, verse 16, he declares it's Assyria that's coming. He's going to come like an evil eagle. He's going to swoop down. I was standing out. I was standing at my window looking out in the backyard. And the little squirrels were out. They were running and he just hey, hey to heaven of good fun time. And I saw something almost like a blink of an eye. I have like a corridor. My backyard is like a corridor. The woods and the house. And like a flash, I saw this thing go come from that, that corridor of, of, of vacancy, you know, of space. Come and swoop down and went you. And we had one little creature hanging on there. He got him. One of our squirrels we'd been feeding and fattening him up for him. A hawk. I mean, it, he was so quick, just like, whew, and he was gone. <laughs> what did he say? Rapture. <laughs> well, there you go. I don't know where the little guys go, but I think it went to dinner. I think it went to dinner. But So when I hear that like an eagle, I think of that. I think of that <laughs> Sweep, swooping in and just going. <laughs> like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house. When we look at Hosea, the 13th chapter, verse 14, Paul is quoting from a verse that offers Israel, listen to me now, the promise of redemption through Christ whom they've forsaken. Do you know what the comparison between Paul and Hosea is? They're both going to fall under the fifth cycle. Paul is a preacher to Israel that the coming of judgment is coming because they've thrown the Messiah out of the vineyard and killed him. Just like Jesus told him. And he's preaching for it coming. And he's preaching this message of redemption. Hosea preached that in the 13th and 14th chapter. He's preaching redemption. Now, I want you to go to Hosea. I want you to, can you find Hosea? Well, go to the front of your book. I don't have all day. Just go front and pick it up or thumb through it like I am or, or do what Don does. As soon as Don gets something like this, you know what he does? He puts tabs in them. Don, he don't wait around for nobody to thumb through nothing. I'll tell you, he works in my Hebrew class with us, and he's got tabs on everything. He goes, I'm there. Oh, how'd you do that? And he had, Tabs. All right, here we are in the 13th chapter, verse 14. Now, I want you to see this because he's quoting it. Your Bible says that he just quoted Hebrews, I mean, not Hebrew, but Hosea 13, 14. Agreed? You got to study by it. That's what it said, didn't it? So, do you still have uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 55? You didn't close your book, did you? Okay. Because I want to compare them. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will, do, I will redeem them from death. 
Now listen to what he says. O death, where is your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? Then he says, compassion will be hidden from my sight. You got that? Now look at what he said. Look at how Paul translated that. O death, where's your sting? O death, where's your victory? Agreed? Okay. Just want you to, I wanted you to be able to see that. I want you to see that. Now, he gave the answer to these two questions. Hosea, watch this now. I put them down on your paper. I wrote this whole thing out so that you could see. For example, when he says, Oh, death, where's your, where's your thorns? He has already said, I will redeem them from death. Do you see that? In Hosea, he said it first. He said it first and then asked the question. <laughs> Please tell me you can see that. Yes. Okay. Oh, Sheol, and it really Sheol, oh, Sheol, where is your sting? He already answered that. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. Do you see that? So where did Paul get the idea that he had theological answers to these two questions and both of them pertain to Christ? He got them from Hosea. I will redeem, I will ransom our theological questions that are answered by Christ. See, I just, I broke them down on your paper to show you how he answered them. See, he asked the question that answered him. He, actually, he answered him before he asked the question so that you could get him right. See, a teacher that tells you, I'm going to give you a test, I'm going to ask you two questions, here are the answers. Oh, yeah, and the key word is death and Sheol. So put the one over here with death and put the other one over here with Sheol and you get an A. I mean, I could have maybe got an A. Not sure, but I think I might have got one if they'd explained that much to me. Do you see that? Oh, death, I will redeem them from death. Oh, Sheol, I will re redeem them from the power of Sheol. Do you see that? See, he gave you the answer. And the answer are the key words that's, I will redeem and I will ransom. Right? Those are key words. Those are theology words of salvation. Right? This is where Paul is. This is where, this is where Paul is. And he understands that those words are based on Christ. And Israel, in the fifth cycle, it's because they have turned away from Christ and thrown God under the bus. Come on. And it's so clear in the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's parable after parable after parable when he talks to Israel. He tells them this and he says, oh, it's going to be... The penalty for that, you, you, you people want signs? Here they are, the, the sign of the north kingdom and the, south of the, the sign of the south kingdom. You dummies are going to get it. You can't reject Christ and think you're going to come out smelling like a rose. I, I don't know that he, he said the rose thing. Listen, where did Paul get the idea of answering the questions? He got it from Hosea who answered them before he gave them to him, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we think every time God gives us a test, it's a serious, complicated test. Who could ever figure it out? Listen, he gave you the answers before he gave you the test. What do you mean you don't know why? <laughs> See, come on, people. Come on. See, I want you to see what Paul saw. See, I want you to, I just broke it down. I want you to see what he saw. And he pulls that out of an old covenant, Jewish age, 
and transfers the theology into the church age and the new covenant. Hoo-ah! That's what you do with the Old Testament. That's how Christ fulfills it. That's how our theology squares up. Paul taught us how to deal with the law and how Christ came to fulfill it, that He is the end of the law, and how you use it to explain New Covenant theology. This is good. Maybe only for me, but I'm enjoying it. When the Israelites rejected God's Son as heir of the vineyard, they rejected God and brought certain divine judgment to themselves. In the parable of the tenant, in Matthew 21, 33 through 46, he couldn't get clear. He sent the prophets. What'd they do? They stoned him and killed him. Throw him, throw him. He sent his son. Certainly they'll listen to the son. Oh, yeah. They, they drug him out of the city and killed him because they didn't want to... They didn't want to get in trouble with the law. <laughs> Jeez. These people are just dumber than a brick. Be sure we're not. Be sure we're not. So what is Paul dealing with? Paul is dealing the same message that Christ has. The church, listen, Israel better wake up and the church better have their eyes open. Because the fifth cycle is coming to the north kingdom because they drug the Messiah out of their vineyard and stoned him or murdered him. And they're in deep trouble with the Father. Okay? In that parable, Jesus says something that Paul picked up in 13 of Matthew, I mean of Acts, so I want you to go to Acts 13 with me for just a moment. Go to Acts 13. I know you can find that one. Acts 13, because he's coming off this parable. He's coming off this parable in the 13th chapter, verses 46 and forward. Paul, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Jews, since you repudiate it, Judge yourself unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Do you know where he got that? He got it from the teachings of Christ out of that parable of the tenants. He said, well, what should, he says, well, what should we do to those people that did that? They said, oh, those are rotten. <laughs> I mean, just... Well, he said, here's what's going to happen. That, well, by the way, you're right about that. And, and he's going to take the kingdom from them and give it to someone else. Someone, listen to me. He said, someone who is worthy of divine production. You know who he gave it to? In the second century AD, he gave it to Gentiles, and we have held on to it all the way to the 21st century. Whoa! And it is our responsibility to be sure we take it as far as we're responsible. We are to carry it until Christ returns. That is our responsibility. He put the kingdom in the hands of Gentiles. Who would have ever thought he'd have put it in the hands of a bunch of pirates? But, but he did. And I am, I am privileged. I am privileged to be part of that. So there's Hosea. All right? There's a good look at Hosea. See, most of you, you'd have looked over there and you'd have seen, well, that comes from Hosea 13, 14, and you would have never looked it up. See how important it is to look that thing up? Oh, you'd have missed one. Here's my second point. Paul translates Hosea 13, 14 differently Listen to me now. Differently than the Hebrew text, right? Does, does Paul in, in Corinthians, did he use the word shield? Is the word victory in, in Hosea? No, these words aren't there. Now, do you suppose Paul knows not to mess with the word? Huh? Oh, yeah. So what's he doing? 
He's cleaning up theology. He's moving the theology from the Jewish age to the church age, from the old covenant to the new covenant. It's his responsibility. So, we know that what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 is different than Hosea 13, 14. Would you agree with that? Now, Paul's Bible, mine's the NASV, uh, New American Standard Bible. That's mine. His was the Septuagint. So, a good student of the Bible, when he goes in and says, whoa, wait, where did Paul get that idea? The first thing you do is go to Septuagint and see what, how they translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. That's the first thing you do. If you're a student of the Word of God, that's the first thing you do. One of the first things that I learned sitting under Bob Thame was to go get me a Septuagint. <laughs> And go back and study the languages again to be sure I knew what I was talking about. Septuagint. When you open the Septuagint to Hosea 13, 14, you find a different translation. So I've laid the three of them out for you. Because this is important. Paul, Paul not only did he leave the Hebrew text, but he left the Septuagint text. And where is he getting the right to do that? And why is he doing it? And how is he doing it? In the Hebrew text, O death, muth, where is your plagues or pestilence? That's because that's part of the fifth cycle of divine discipline. If you read Deuteronomy 28-21, it's, it's part of the five cycles of discipline. O Sheol, where is your destruction? we find that that word is also carried with the fifth cycle. Listen to me. By Isaiah, interestingly, by Isaiah 28, 1 through 3, and verse 11. If you know anything about Isaiah 28, 11, Paul quotes it in, in 1 Corinthians 14th chapter, verses 20 through 22. And he's talking about tongues. And he's talking about tongues as a sign of the fifth cycle of discipline. Isaiah is showing that a foreign nation with a foreign language is going to roll into your city and take you captive and put it to the ground. When they're talking about it in 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about it again as a five cycle sign and it's going to come by Rome. That is the key word destruction that is used in the Hebrew text. When you go to the Septuagint, the Septuagint has O death, Thanatos. That's a key word for death. That's spiritual connotations. Death where is your penalty? Use the definite article hey with the word dike or dike. You can find, and this word is translated penalty by justice. A judgment by justice. The, the penalty, the judgment of justice. And you can, listen, this is found, the same word, watch this, in, in 2 Thessalonians, oh man, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10, this, is, this, this word penalty, and it's used for judgment that comes by the justice of God, a just judgment, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty. There's the word. There it is. The penalty is identical with this. Will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Do you see it? This, the two words are put in conjunction. Away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you who, who was believed. There the word is used 
in a proper context. O oh, death, where is your penalty or the, the just judgment? And then he says, O oh, Hades, which is the Greek word for Sheol, O oh, Hades, where is your sting? He put the word sting, which is the same word that Paul used in the Greek. So Paul, listen to me. <laughs> Paul is definitely quoting from the Septuagint. And he changed one word. Well, he changed two. He no longer uses the word Hades or Sheol. <laughs> you know why? Listen to me now. Because the theology of the new covenant and the theology of the church age is that when you die, you don't go to Sheol. You go to the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So he changes it to put it to death. You know what that is? He's talking about the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. He changed the word because the theology is different. Come on now. Change the word. From the Septuagint, from the Septuagint, he changed the word penalty to victory. It's the only other word he changed. So he made two changes, and they're both theological. And look at verse 57. Where does the victory come from? Where does the victory come from? You know why? Because Jesus Christ paid the just penalty of our sins. And he took our death away. And now we wait for the resurrection of life. Come on. See what he did theologically? He took the word victory in 45, 55, and 57. The victory. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's victory. Paul's translation came from the Septuagint text. Listen. The translation came from... Listen to me now. The translation came from the Septuagint text. But the theology came from church age change to new covenant change. You know why? Because Christ came to fulfill the law. And we live in a new day. We live in a new day. If you want to know more about the change from the old covenant to new covenant, you should read Hebrews, the fifth chapter through chapter 10. I put that out there, knowing that most of you won't, but it would be certainly a good wish of mine. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 6, we are told that we, men like myself, people like yourself who go out and, and put the gospel in front of people, are ministers of the new covenant in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're told that in verses tw in the third chapter, verses 12 through 18, and he says the reason that should be preached is because of the power of transformation of lives. Do you realize we live in a dispensation with any person, any person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day, get indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and transformation is now a matter of choice. Because it's set there, it's already been established in your life to be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit taking the word of God brings transformation to the life of every person who believes the gospel. And that never happened in any other discipline. And Paul is all over this idea. Paul is all over this idea. In, the, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 24, he is the meteor of a new covenant. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 15, for this reason, he, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death, Thanatos, has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That's why Paul has made these changes. We're in a new dispensation, we're under a new covenant, and there's a new theology in town. <laughs> so 
in my third point, Paul explained the sting, sting of death because of Adam's transgression. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, he says, the answer, the sting of death is the sin. It's Adam's sin, and the power of that sin is the law. In other words, what Paul is telling you, that the antidote for the poisonous sting is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a world that is dying, dead, dying. We have the dying dead, and we have the antidote. And it's free. There's no charge to it. It's called grace. You talk about a great health care. That's about as good as good, doesn't it? Don't cost you anything. Don't cost anybody anything but God himself and his son, which is a great cost, isn't it? For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, Thanatos, so death, Thanatos, spread to all man. What's the answer? What's uh, the answer? Well, the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the antidote. Now listen, here's what Paul is after in, in his argument. If there had been no Adamic sin, there would be no deaths. If there had been no deaths, there would be no need for a gospel of grace salvation. That's his point. He argued that in verses 12 through 19. But because of the imputation of Adam's sin, which Paul describes in Romans 5.12 as being spread to all mankind, being spread to all mankind theologically is the imputation of Adam's sin. But because of the imputation of Adam's original sin, the human race doesn't have to do anything to, live, to die, but has to do everything to live. So you're born dead. Okay. And finally, when Paul talks about victory, he talked about it in verse 22 of the 15th chapter, verse 22. He said, in Adam all die, in Christ all will be made alive. Death, oh death, where is your victory? Where is the victory over, over the judgment? Where is the justice over the judgment? It's on the cross. It's on the cross. It's on the cross. And that's where victory. When you go to the cross of Jesus Christ and he took, where he took the judgment for your sin, when you go there and willfully and freely accept it by faith, you enter into victory. You are now not a victim. You are a victor. You are now, you now have the ability to be a conqueror and a more than a conqueror in Christ. Come on now. Come on. So, listen to how Paul closes out verse 57. But thanks. But do you know what that word is in the, in the Greek? It's chorus. It's chorus. Chorus is the word for grace. And when he says that, it doesn't mean thanks. It means have a grace attitude of praise. It means have a grace attitude of praise. He didn't use the word thanksgiving. But what's where we get the word Eucharist? It's got the EU on the front of the word grace. He didn't put it there. Put the word chorus. It means See, he's explained 55, 56, and now 57, and he's closing it out. But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, because of his great grace orientation, our great grace orientation to what God has done for us in Christ, but thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> if it gets better, any better than that, I don't know what I'd do. Whew. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break. Go downstairs, have some coffee and donuts or whatever is down there. Let's pray. 
Well, Father, we're thankful. What a great picture of theology Paul painted out of Hosea 13, 14. Maybe the next time we go into that Old Testament and we see some of the things there that are Christ-oriented discussions that we can bring it out of the Jewish age, out of the Old Covenant, and bring it into the, into the theology of the New Covenant of the church age and not be wrong about it. And Paul gives us a great example of how to do that. It's all about Christ orientation. Keeping it all about grace. Depending on the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth and the truth set us free. We pray for our offering today. We'd be good stewards of it, Father. Just may we, may we always be good stewards of it. Spend a little on ourselves and spend the most to reach the world for Christ because we're leaving. I believe the train is pulled out of the station. We're just waiting, waiting for it to stop at our, our pickup place when we can board it. We're thankful for, for it. May we be faithful. May we be faithful till you come. In Jesus' name, amen.